open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Ruth. We continue our study in the book of Ruth. This afternoon, we're going to read verse, in chapter 2, we're going to read verses 14 through verse 23. Ruth chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up, and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth, and gave to her that she had reserved after that she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? <coughs> Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabites said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat <coughs> harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So today we're going to look at the idea of revelation. Revelation. Last week we looked at the topic of grace as grace is unfolded in this book of Ruth. And as we've seen this progression in the book of Ruth, we see how all of these, these topics that we've dealt with are, are interconnected and build on top of each other. Now before we get to the idea of revelation and, and look at your outline um, that you've been given, I want to first of all go through a couple of things uh, very briefly just by way of introduction. I'd like to talk quickly about a brief review of what we talked about last week and then make a couple of observations about the text by way of exposition that will help us understand a little bit more of what is happening in chapter 2. So last week we talked about grace. We defined grace as unmerited favor. We saw that mercy and pity was closely related to the idea of grace. But very specifically, we talked about the grace and graces that are added to the believer after we've been a recipient of saving grace, redeeming grace. Once you have been redeemed, God gives grace upon grace to your life. Secondly, we looked at the idea of sufficient grace. We looked at the life of Boaz and we saw sufficient grace grace in his life. You recall that we listed a pedigree of Boaz, who he was. he was. He was the guy that everybody wanted to be friends with. He had all this list of, of positive things. His pedigree was pretty, pretty spectacular. And then we looked at a couple of genealogies that showed us that the mother of Boaz was Rahab, the harlot. And we saw that despite that very negative connotation in his life, 
sufficient grace caused that backstory to be a backstory, and what came to the fore was the grace of God in his life. Thirdly, we looked at the manifested grace in the life of Ruth. Remember, she asked the question, why have I found grace in your sight? Ruth took a very honest evaluation of her life and basically said, there's no way I should be a recipient of grace from you, Boaz. You're a mighty man of wealth. You're a dignified, respected person in Judah. I'm a Moabitess. I'm a widow. I'm poor. I have nothing to offer. And of course, isn't that what grace does? Grace is unmerited favor, undeserved favor. It's not something we can work for or earn. And Boaz gave her very, uh, two very simple and quick answers. And he said, grace has made you a virtuous woman. And because of grace, because you are a born again believer, I am going to grace you and gift you grace upon grace. And then in the last place, we did not have time to look at, I would like to look at it briefly, but then grace in the life of Ruth. Grace works. Grace labors. We, we, that's kind of counterintuitive, but grace works by humility. It works by obedience. Grace bestowed yields abundant laboring. The Apostle Paul said this, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace that was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul was able to trace his his ministry, his abundant laborers, his spiritual fruit, his uh, preaching abilities and opportunities, he traced it all back to the grace of God. And he said in no uncertain terms, the grace of God being divine in nature, when it's operative in our life, is something that is characterized, like Paul said it was, it works, grace is in action, Grace is being worked out and in and through us. It's begetting fruit. It's God's grace. It's almost like a living organism that can't be stagnant, can't be stale, can't be locked away. Grace is not laziness. Excuses. Grace doesn't make paper mache Christians. Grace is active. Grace labors. Paul said in another place, speaking of Christ who gave himself for us, why? That he might redeem us from all iniquity, negatively, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Paul labored so that the grace of God would not have been given to him in vain. And that is a very critical, it's a very crucial truth about the transforming power of God's divine grace in your life. God works within us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Grace comes first, but God does not work apart from or, or without us once we have been saved. It's grace, but grace works. Secondly, I would like to make just a few comments about um, the text of chapter 2 that we read, just by way of a few expository thoughts that highlight uh, some of these things here, and then we'll look at a few others as we go through um, the outline. First of all, in verse 14, Boaz invites Ruth to participate with the reapers in this meal. And so they would have a probably a movable structure or a tent or a covering. And the reapers, along with Boaz, would have a midday meal. And we get a time clue here because the, the parched corn that he gave her, the Bible says in several places you cannot have a meal of parched corn until 
the first fruits are offered to the Lord. And so we understand, and we talked previously about the, the first fruits, but um, we understand that the first fruits have been offered, the harvest is in full swing, and she's involved with, with a, a very heavy labor in the field. You'll notice also that Boaz reached her this food. Think about Ruth for a minute. Here she is in this very odd scene. Everything is homogeneous. We have the reapers who know what they're doing. We have, have Boaz, the, the, the boss. We have this meal. As they've done years and years and years past, and here's a stranger in the midst of this meal. So with her humility and her virtue, she's not going to reach in and grab a bunch of food. She waits, and Boaz reaches to her this food. Verse 17 says, so she gleaned, so she, after that meal, she leaves to glean again. Verse 17, she gleaned in the field until evening, and she beat out that which she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. How long did Ruth glean? The word for evening is the word dusk that encompasses both the time right before sundown and then after the sun goes down. Ruth gleaned from sun up to sundown. She was very diligent about her work even though she would know the blessing and the benevolence of Naomi. A tremendous example of diligence and of working. That verse goes on to say she beat out her gleanings. So what they would do was take either a stick or a rock. Once they had picked up the gleanings, then they had to beat it out. They had to thresh it. They had to separate the chaff from the grain. It was, it was hard work. They would use a rock if they had a lot. They would use sticks if the quantity of grain was small. But in any essence, after the hard work of gleaning, then they had to thresh it. And then the third interesting aspect of this verse is an ephah. She got about an ephah of barley. So she went out probably to get enough for a meal or two for herself and her mother-in-law. An ephah is almost a full bushel. It's 25 to 30 pounds of grain. It was probably going to be enough for, for five to ten days for them. It was a large enough amount of grain that it probably was, was an issue for her to carry that from the field all the way back to town. 25 to 30 pounds of grain. Again, according to the benevolence of Boaz. In verse 18, it's a little bit awkward. The last half of verse 18 says she brought forth and gave to her that which she had reserved after she was sufficed. That's not talking about her gleanings. What that's talking about at the meal where she was at with Boaz. She had left out part of that, and that's what she brought home back to Naomi. She was thinking about her mother-in-law even as she's working, even as she's at the table with Boaz and the reapers. She eventually comes home in verse 19 and what does Naomi say? Naomi says, where in the world have you wrought today? I mean, there's no way, Ruth, you could bring home 30 pounds of grain in one day. The, the largeness of this, this, this gleanings had had to put within Naomi this, this idea that uh, it was a special gleaning, it was a special field, something was going on here. And we're going to look at that shortly. And then in verse 20, lastly, the word kindness. Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness. This is a very important word in the Old Testament. It's a very special word in the Old Testament. 
It's used about 150 times translated as mercy. It's used about 75 times translated as kindness or loving kindness. Very, very often speaking about the kindness or the loving kindness of Jehovah God. Kindly disposed to his people. He is merciful. He has this loving kindness. And it also has the idea of faithfulness in a relationship. He's loving kind, he's kind, he's merciful to his people. And because of his faithfulness in that relationship, he will ensure that he is extending kindness in the same way that we saw last week, he extends grace upon grace. It is one of the most important words, I think, in the Old Testament with my very small understanding of, of the Hebrew language and looking at uh, some of the words that are used quite often to describe Jehovah God. And again, Naomi attributes the gleanings to the kindness, the mercy, the faithfulness of Jehovah God himself. So now let's look at the outline and progress through that as we consider the message this afternoon. And again, I want to consider this idea of, of revelation. The revelation of Boaz to Ruth, the revelation of Boaz to Naomi, which is kind of third hand to her, and then in the middle of this, how this is all worked out. Let's first of all talk about how this is unfolded in the life of Ruth. Then let's step back and look at the idea of revelation to the New Testament believer and, and, and then superimpose that on chapter 2 here. The Holy Spirit in the book of Ruth chooses to reveal the person of the kinsman redeemer and to reveal his intentions for Ruth in a, we'll say, a step-by-step -step way. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal from chapter 1, when Ruth is rescued from the land of Moab, to chapter 4, when she is married to Boaz and subsequently gives birth and is included in the Messianic line. He slowly unfolds and, and opens up to the reader of Scripture and to Ruth herself his grand and glorious plan. We've likened this before by way of example when we think of Revelation as, as a dark room and the, a door to that room is slowly open and light slowly comes in and fills the room. When we think about Revelation, this is kind of the way God reveals himself and his workings to us, a little bit by a little bit, and it starts building on each other. Boaz According to Naomi's understanding, Boaz revealed in a systematic, sequential way. First of all, Naomi has a kinsman of her husband's. And then he's spoken of as a mighty man of wealth. And then we find out he's of the family of Elimelech. Then we find out his name is Boaz, which means strength. And then Ruth says again, He's of the family of Elimelech. And then Naomi says, wait a minute, he's of near kin to us. He's one of our next kinsmen. Whether she had forgotten about this man, maybe she felt she could not approach him because of what they had done in leaving Judah, Bethlehem, and going to Moab. Then there's this dramatic presentation where he is very near to us, He's the kinsman redeemer, and he could be the Goel. He could be the one that would buy the land. He's the one that could take care of us. He could redeem. He could rescue us. And she might have anticipated being rescued from debt. I doubt that she thought that Boaz, in fact, would purchase Ruth to be his wife in chapter 4 and verse 10. There's this progressive revelation of Boaz in the life of Ruth. 
in the same way I trust you can recognize in your life there was a progressive revelation of who Jesus Christ was in your life that eventually by grace through faith drew you to him and then I also trust that revelation goes on every single day as you walk with him so let's step back just for a minute and, and look at revelation for the New Testament believer. There's two ideas when you think about revelation. Number one, God uncovers or unveils or lays open what he wants to disclose. And he not only uncovers it, but he makes it known. He manifests it. He teaches it to reveal or revelation in the New Testament has two ideas, subjective and objective. The secret of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is subjective in places like John where Jesus says, the saying of Isaiah the prophet is being fulfilled. Who has believed our report and note, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who has Christ revealed to them in their mind, in their heart? Who has taught the reality of Christ? The subjective use of it is when it's presented to our mind. The objective use is when it's presented to our senses, sight, hearing. And this is the way Paul said. Paul said it pleased God to reveal his son in me so that I could preach to the heathen. The son was revealed to him on the road to Damascus. He saw, and then he was blind. He felt, he heard. It was a very sensory revelation of the reality of who Christ was. So when we think about revelation, we're talking about an action of God whereby he uncovers something that's been veiled or hidden, and then he makes it known, he discloses it. He does so by words or by deeds. Our pastor at the communion time quoted Hebrews chapter 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoken time past to the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. God used various ways, diverse manners to progressively teach us about his character, his acts. <coughs> You cannot, with human reasoning, find out God. You cannot use a scientific method to find out who God is. God alone must reveal himself to mankind. He alone is the source of himself, of his plan. Jesus said, all things are delivered unto me of the Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and, here's where you come in, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Everybody should jump up and shout, Christ has been revealed to me by the Son, by the Holy Spirit, in His Word. The identity of Christ can only be known through divine revelation. Again, our pastor read Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages past, from generation, way, way back there, is now made manifest to his saints. What is that mystery, Paul? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. You can know him, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the beauty of divine revelation. With God as your teacher, you will learn. With God as your teacher, you will know, you will understand.
that's just a general idea of revelation. We see this revelation of who Boaz is and his works and what he wants to do and his intentions for Ruth as chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4 unfold. And again, typically revelation has some product or it's trying to produce something in our life. Paul said that God revealed his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So secondly now, I would like to move from that to some very specific revelations that Boaz has for Ruth. Boaz is going to reveal who he is slowly but sequentially and fully and finally to both Ruth and Naomi. And not just about himself, but he's going to reveal what he's going to do for Ruth, what he, where he wants her to be, what he wants her to do. And as we go through these, I'm going to, at the same time, by way of application, use these same four adjectives to describe what, what, what God wants for his people, what God has revealed to us as Christians. Very similar ideas, very similar application. So secondly, what is it that Boaz has intended for Ruth? Number one. He wants her to abide. We did not read verse 8, but in verse 8, Boaz says to Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. The intention of Boaz that he has for Ruth is that she would abide in his field. Do not go anywhere else. Don't make the same mistake that Elimelech and Naomi made when they left the fields of Bethlehem and went to Moab. Stay here. Stay fast by my maidens. Abide here. Do you remember in chapter 1 verse 14 when Orpah kissed Naomi, and then took off. Orpah kissed Naomi, but Ruth clave to her mother-in-law. It's the same word in Hebrew. To clave is the same as abide. It's a word that means to, to cling to, to impinge upon, to, to catch by pursuit, to stay. In the same way that Ruth just clung on to Naomi and would not let her go, Boaz says, in that same way, abide in my field. Don't stray. Don't go to another field. Don't let your, your, your eyes gaze upon a field where, over the hill where the grass is greener. In the same way, your heavenly Boaz wants you to abide in his fields alone. He wants you to cleave to them, to stay, to stay in the field of grace. Boaz expected from Ruth her to stay in his field because he knew the intentions he had for her. He knew who he was. He knew who she was. There were these very tangible effects that he would show to her. And he had to know she did have, as he revealed himself to her, every intention to stay there. So it is in the spiritual realm. Christ does not want his people gleaning, living off of some other field, going from one field one day to another field to the next day. Recall what Jesus said, again a verse we looked at last week, Abide in me, and I in you. Stay here. Stay home. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. The branch cannot bear fruit if it's a wild branch trying to graft itself into every tree it sees. You cannot bring forth fruit except you abide in me. 
Christ in a spiritual way says the same thing. Have you ever known anyone in your Christian experience who has in fact gone away? Who has left? You know, Peter, the Apostle Peter was always rash with his mouth. He was always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. But he said one thing that was absolutely astounding. When multitudes were leaving Christ and Jesus turned to them and he said, will you also go away? Peter gives the perfect answer. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Thou and thou only. Where are we going to go? Peter's, Peter got it right. He said the right thing at the right time. With wisdom. Where can we go but to the Lord? John said in his epistle, Now little children, abide in him. Stay till the end, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. When Boaz told Ruth to abide here in his field, there's some implications there. The implications are that that field is a quality field. It will provide for her. The implication is that there's a quantity and a quality in that field. It will be sufficient for her. The implication that his field will never grow fallow will never grow outside of his control. He has her there for very good reasons. And, and Ruth, to her credit, as we read through this book, we find out, pick your word, consecrated, dedicated, single-minded, consistent. She, in fact, stays in Boaz's field. She was committed. She was dedicated, she was consecrated to this idea of abiding. We have to ask ourselves, are we content to abide in the field of grace? To abide where he has us? And to trust and every day go out to the harvest, sun up to sun down. Oh, yes, he's graced us. We could be lazy and sit on the sidelines. That's not what Ruth did. She labored more abundantly because of grace in the provided field. Abide. Are we abiding? Secondly, abundance. Boaz has an intention for Ruth that she would have and she would enjoy an abundance at his hand. He told his reapers, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. He was being a lot more generous than Leviticus uh, chapter 19 speaks about when it talks about the gleanings for the, the widow, the, the alien, the poor. He was allowing her greater access to his things, to his harvest, to his goods. In the harvest process, the, the reapers would first go through, cut the barley by stalks, and then following them, there would be more reapers that would gather 8 to 10 to 12 of these and bind them together. And only then could the gleaners come through and pick up the little pieces that were left after the sheaves were carted off. Boaz permits Ruth to glean even among the harvesters and he instructs them not to bind every sheaf. Leave some for her, loose. Then he goes on to say, and let handfuls of purpose on purpose fall for her so she can get those as well. And so as we mentioned, she gleaned until the evening and had 25 to 30 pounds of grain. She did not abuse the kindness of Boaz. She did not use grace to be lackadaisical or lazy. She did not become presumptuous. Again, by way of application for us, when we think about abundance, the intention of your heavenly Boaz is that you would have and enjoy an abundance at his hand. And we don't mean health 
and wealth. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Uh, a man's life does not consist in the things which he has. Boaz said, abide in my field. Christ says, abide in my field. Don't go to the field of the world to try to reap worldly stuff. Self-fulfillment, self-promotion, self-purpose, entertainment or escape, or whatever you might reap out there. There is an abundance of that stuff out there, and that gives us vanity and vexation of spirit. But in Christ's field, there is an abundance there. And we should have holy gluttony, as it were, to eat in Christ's field. An abundance of his word, an abundance of his graces, his ordinances, an abundance of prayer, of public and private worship, of co-laboring with him, on and on and on. What, in fact, does God own? He owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And again, as the brother prayed, he's given us all things richly to enjoy. He gives gifts unto men. He makes all grace abound to us. Paul said, all things are ours. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Can you see the spiritual imagery of, of the field of the Lord teeming with spiritual fruit, with spiritual goodness, not the least of which is Christ himself? And the instruction is, abide here and you will have an abundance. Grace upon grace. And again, Ruth worked, she labored, she applied herself to the task at hand. Do you have an abundance from him? Do you recognize that he's allowed you to, to reap among the sheaves? That he's dropped handfuls of purpose on purpose for you? Do you have the understanding that he wants a church that is strong and vibrant and vigorous and not a church that is weak and failing and spiritually unstable and doesn't know where her next meal is coming from spiritually? There is an abundance. Thirdly, association. Boaz wants Ruth to be with him right now for fellowship, for communion. He wants to associate with her. Later, that association is going to culminate in marriage. Boaz, in verse 14, as we said, it's an odd scene. He invites her to join in this meal where everything is homogeneous except for Ruth. She doesn't belong there. She didn't earn a slot at the table. She couldn't buy a ticket to be there. But because of love, Boaz says, I want you to share a meal with me. And there was no reproach against Boaz for inviting a Gentile from Boab to share a meal with him. Unlike Christ, who was always reproached for being a friend of publicans and sinners. The seven references in the New Testament where he's eating or drinking with publicans and sinners, and that was a reproach to him. Have you ever considered the infinite distance between you and God? The infinite distance between you and the Lord, and yet he draws you close. He wants to associate with you. He wants you to be at his table. He's not ashamed to call you brethren. 
That's a mind blower because there's an infinite distance between you and God. This association is going to build and build and build until it's going to culminate in the closest association between Boaz and Ruth that there possibly could be. In likewise manner between God and you. His association with you is going to build and build and build until you are joined with him as a bride is joined to her groom. Fourthly, assurances. Boaz's disposition towards Ruth has several very tangible things in her life. And it's almost as though he has to reinforce his feelings towards her so she can have this uh, she could have this assurance because there is such a difference between the two it's highly unlikely that a mighty man of wealth from Bethlehem would do this for a Moabite widow but he starts to extend all these graces to her and he assures her he assures her of continuance in his field to the very end of both harvests, protection in the rough business of gleaning, food and water when she needs it. He assures her she can glean among the sheaves. He assures her of kindness and of care. He is going to take such good care of her. And we have assurance upon assurance that he extends to her. Think about Ruth for just a minute. When, when Ruth comes into the field of Boaz and, and she asks for permission to glean, at that moment, we don't know what's going to happen. It, it could go south, or she could be invited to, in fact, glean. She's at the mercy of Boaz and his servants. Remember, she is an outsider. She has no claims upon Boaz. She's on foreign soil. She's on the property of Boaz. The harvest belongs to Boaz. She cannot presume that everyone in Judah is going to deal kindly with her, even though the law prescribes the possibility of gleanings. So she's dependent upon his mercy. But the instant the word is given to her that invites her in. The moment that the door is open for her and she's invited, yea, brought into his field, first by the reapers, then by Boaz himself, she not only has assurance, she has liberty. She has a bold freedom to act upon what Boaz has said. The intention that Boaz has for Ruth is that she would be assured of his kindness, his care for her. And he's done so much for her that she has this, without being presumptuous, she has a liberty, a holy boldness to every day go back to that field and get another 30 pounds of grain. Think, as we think about this image, think of Christ and you. Do you take God at his word? I mean, are, are you able to appropriate the promises in his word? His directions? His exhortations? His encouragement to us? Such that we have a holy boldness, we have, have liberty, and freedom, so that like Ruth, we're bringing home 30 pounds of grain every day and pretty soon we run out of places we can't stick it anywhere anymore because we're getting the blessings that he's promised us to and he's assured us of those. One of the graces that seems to be lacking the most in Christians, at least in the many, many circles that I run in, is the grace of assurance. If there's anybody you can believe, it's God himself. 
what God has said in his word. You have to believe him. He, is, he doesn't lie, obviously. What he says is true. He says, I've written to these things to you that believe on my name, who believe on the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John. 1 John again. We know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us an understanding that we may know him, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Boaz laid out all these assurances to Ruth. Ruth took him at his word and was assured and believed. Oswald Chambers says this, My assurance is to be built upon God's assurances to me. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that I may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. In other words, I'm not going to be obsessed with my apprehensions or my little faith. I'm going to remember God's words of assurance. These four descriptors of the intentions of Boaz to Ruth are very parallel to the intentions that God has for his people. God's instruction for his people, abiding, abundance, association, and assurance. In the last place this afternoon, the revelation of Boaz to Naomi. Naomi is going to come, chapter 3 and chapter 4, she's going to come a little bit more directly into the mix. Here in chapter 2, it's all third-hand information that she's getting from Ruth, but she's making some spiritual, logical connections. And there's two things that I think it produces in the life of Ruth. The outline, I've left those blank because I didn't want you to jump ahead. The revelation of Boaz to Naomi, number one. He is near kin to us. He is a near kin to us. You can almost hear her thrill, her joy, that, that, that hope, that comfort. The kinsman redeemer. He's near to us. The same thrill, comfort, and joy as you think about your kinsman redeemer. He's near. Hebrews chapter 2, he's not ashamed to call you brethren. Again, I will declare thy name to my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. He says to his father, Behold, I and the children which God has given me. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. You have a kinsman redeemer who is near. One of the problems that Hebrews talks about, a commentator mentioned this, we immediately transpose Christ as, as Hebrews opens up with his, his glory because he's so much excellent and so much more better than the angels and Moses and, and the Levitical priesthood and all these things. We marvel at Christ in the heavenly places with glory and honor and majesty. We forget that he is near. He took upon himself not the nature of angels, but he took upon himself the seed of Abraham. He's near to us. He can be sympathetic to us. The man, Christ Jesus. This is a revelation that God gives his people about the reality of the nearness of Christ to us. 
He has spoken to us by His Son. Naomi has the lights go on when she realizes He is near. Secondly, the revelation of Boaz to Naomi brings about for Naomi personal revival. Revival. Remember what, I mean, she's this bitter old woman. Oh, don't call me, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasantness. Call me bitter. Uh, Shaddai has, has dealt very bitterly with me. Almighty God has afflicted me. I went out full, but now he brought me back empty and poor. But now when she realizes that the kinsman redeemer is close, that this connection is being made, you can almost hear in, in her, her words this, this spiritual confidence, this spiritual awakening, this, this revival of religion in the soul. It's like, wait a minute. There's hope. There's life, there's light, there's warmth, there's heat. She was in this backslidden condition. She was bitter. And as Ruth comes back from the field, toting 30 pounds of grain, explains what has happened, Naomi realizes God has not left off taking care of her. There was this whole process that was not yet done. The conclusion had not yet been finalized. It had not been brought to fruition. God was at work. And you could sense, and it will develop in the next couple of chapters, this revival, this enlivening of Naomi. And again, this is all by third-hand information. She's just getting all of this by what Naomi has said to her. And is this not similar to the believer who needs that personal reviving often? And when we bring Christ near, when we understand his closeness, and when we go out to him as Naomi is going to go out uh, to, 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 uh, to Boaz through Ruth and through the law and through God's word and see this plan effected, she once again is restored to spiritual health. She's restored to walking with God. Well, we'll stop there. This is a tremendous story of God's providence, of God's redemption and grace. And the same story is written in your life, my friend. God's dealings with you have been providential. And they've been marked by grace and redemption. May we have the same thrilling response that both Ruth and Naomi had as they realized God was working in them and with them to do, willing to do of his good pleasure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing your son to us. When we consider billions across this world today at this very moment who do not know you and yet you have spoken to us you've revealed your son to us we bless you and we thank you lord we pray that we would be those that would be diligent to abide in the field of grace that our association would be marked by that association and fellowship and communion with your son the lord jesus christ that we would know in abundance from thy hand thank you for providing all things needful and necessary and lord might we take at your word the assurances that you provide for us and so father might we be a vigorous a vital a spiritually strong believer in church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.